Chapter 13. That night in the middle watch the wind veered from east-northeast to east and fell off a knot. The humidity increased and the temperature rose a degree and the captains of the fleet stirred in their sleep and awoke momentarily, knowing that another monsoon had blown its course. Now the wind would blow wet warm from the east for three months until May and then would veer as suddenly southward gathering heat and wetness. Then in the fall to east-northeast again, dry and cool, until the spring of next year, when it would once more veer to the east and fall off a knot. The captains fell asleep again, but they slumbered less easily. The east wind heralded the time of the typhoons. Brock shifted irritably in his bunk and scratched. What's with thee, Tyler? Liza said, awake and clear-headed instantly as a woman is when a mate is troubled or her child ill. She was in the bunk across the fetid cabin. Nothing. Liza. The wind be changed, that be all. Get thy rest. He adjusted his flannel nightcap and yawned heavily. Liza got up ponderously and plodded across the cabin. What be thee doing? Opening porthole, lad. Go to sleep. Brock turned over and closed his eyes, but he knew that sleep had left him. He felt the tang of the wind sweep into the cabin. There be fog soon, he said. Liza got back into her bunk, and the straw-filled mattress creaked. She lay comfortably under the covers. It be the bullion that be worrying thee, bain't it? Yus. Don't worry thy head now. Tomorrow's the time for that. She yawned and scratched at the bite of a bedbug. It'll be grand to be ashore again. Will it take long to build a house? Not long, he said, and turned over. This ball what Struin be giving, she said, choosing the words with great care. That be a smack in thy face. Ridiculous. Go to sleep. Brock was instantly on his guard. Course, if we was dressed proper, that'd be a smack right back, eh, Tyler? Brock groaned but was careful not to let Liza hear. The news of the ball had swept the fleet the moment Struan had told Skinner. Every husband in Asia had denounced the Taipan, for they knew that he had stolen their peace. And every man's blood had quickened. The betting had begun. Chevron Tillman was odds-on favorite. Thee mean spike his guns with finery, he said. Good idea, Liza. Thee look proper smart in that red silk dress what I. That old rag. Liza said with a contemptuous sniff. Thee must be joking. Old, thee says. Why, thee's only worn it but three or four time. I think thee looks. Three year I be wearing that. And, thee be need a new dress coat and breeches and fancy waistcoat and what not. I enjoys the ones I got, he said. I thinks, it be time I went shopping. A four every decent bolt of silk in Asia be bide up, and every seamstress be booked. Tomorrow I be going to Macau. In Grey Witch. But, Liza, for a flippity ball what dirk. I be leaving on the noon tide. Yus, Liza, Brock said recognizing that special tone in her voice, knowing that no amount of arguing would take the bit out of her teeth. The pox on Struan, but in spite of his fury, the thought of the prize and the judging stirred him. That be a marvelous idea. Marvelous. Now, why bain't I a thinking o' oh that? The pox on Struan. Liza adjusted her pillow and continued to ruminate about the ball. She had already decided that Tess was going to win the prize and the honor, whatever the cost. Yes, she told herself again, whatever it costed. But how to persuade Tyler to let Tess go t-ball? He'd be right pig-headed, about her. It'd be time to think about our Tess, she said. What about her? It'd be time thee be thinking about a mate for her. What? Brock sat upright in the bunk. Be thee out of thy head. Tess be hardly out her nappies. She's bare sixteen. How old were I when thee married me? that be different, by God. Thee were old for thy age, by God. Times is changed. Time enough and plenty for that flibberty folderol, by God. A mate for Tess. Thee be sick in thy head, woman. And what a thing to say in middle of night. Now, don't be mentioning that again or I be tacking my belt to thy back. He turned his back on her furiously and slammed the pillow and closed his eyes. Yes, Tyler, Liza said, smiling. She did not condemn him for the beatings he had given her. They had been few, 
and never with violence or in a drunken rage. And were a long time ago. For twenty years she had lived with him and she was content with her man. Liza, girl, Brock said tentatively, his face still to the wall, detest know about, well, about, things. Course not, she said, shocked. She be brought up proper. Well, by God, it's about time thee took her aside and tells her, he fumed, sitting up again. And, thee better watch her careful like. By the cross, if I catch any sniffing around our Tess, what makes thee think she be old enough? Has the girl sighed anything? Be she acting different? Course she be watched. Ridiculous to think not. Ridiculous. Liza snorted. You men be all the same. Ha! Huh. Do this and do that, and threats and what not when the girl's just a growing and readying to be wed. And I'll thank thee not to swear so much, Mr. Brock. It baint nice and baint proper. Thee'll say no more about it, by God, and that be an end to it, by God. Liza smiled complacently to herself. Now, who's it to be? Not that neglect thumb, by God. Who, young Sinclair, no brass, and too hoity toity and churchy, but sound as a bell and a future, no doubt, and in the council of God rotting Longstaff. Nothing like a reverend son in a family. Possible. The American, Jefferson, Cooper, better, rich enough, powerful enough, but a bleedin' foreigner what hates us English. Even so, Brock and C.O.O. Per Tillman joined together be making a nice knife in the gut of the noble house. Gorth'd be good, but he be her half-brother so he be out. Pity. Her mind ranged over the many that would make good husbands. The man had to have money and power and potential. And an iron will and a strong arm to control her. Yes, Liza thought. That girl'll be needin' a good belting on her buttocks from time to time. She be as willful as they come. And not an easy one to tame. Longstaff would be perfect. But he be married. Though I heard his wife be sickly and in London. So mayhaps we should wait. The list whittled to two. But which, Tyler, for the love of God, won't thee let a man sleep? What is it now? What'll that devil do to Cullum Struan? Don't know. Kill him, mayhaps. I don't know. He'll be doing something terrible, that be certain. Cullum be a gutty young spark to stand up like that in. Brock laughed. I wished thee'd seen Dirk's face. That bastard were rocked solid. Rocked solid he were. The boy were right smart to give the land to the church. He saved his D.A. from danger. Anne, the ridiculous woman, not me, by God. Dirk be a wanton that hillock desperate. He'd a bid and bid and I'd a stopped when he was strangled by the price. Weren't for that whippersnapper, Dirk be on his knees right now. Busted. Or strewned let thee strangle. Likewise. No he be wanting that hillock. He be wanting thee wrecked more. No thee be wrong. Go tea, sleep. What'll he do to Cullum? Don't know. He be a vengeful man. They two've hatred between M now. I never seed Dirk so riled. A feud tween him and the boy could work nice for us in. For a moment fear swarmed through Liza. Fear for her man. Fear of the violence between him and Struan. Enmity that would end only in the death of one. Or both. Dear Lord above, she prayed for the millionth time, let there be peace between them. Then the fear left her and she said to herself as she had always said, what's T, B is T, B. And this reminded her of Hamlet, and of Will Shakespeare who was her passion. Why not build a playhouse, Tyler? On Hong Kong. We be staying here now, baint we? Yus. Brock brightened, his mind taken away from Struan. That be a good idea. Liza. Right good. A four that sod think of it. Yus, I be talking to Skinner tomorrow. I'll start the fund. And, we be sending for a group of players. We be putting on a play for Christmas. You think what it'll be? Liza held her tongue. She would have said Romeo and Juliet, but that would have been stupid for she knew that her husband would see instantly through her purpose. Yes, Tess be the key to the Brocks and the Struins. But the match be not ending in tragedy. Not like the Montagues and Capulets. If Gorth had done that to thee, taken thy knoll, what would thee have done?
Don't know, love. I'm glad it weren't Gorf. Go tea, sleep now. Liza Brock let her mind wander. Now, which of the two'd be best? Best for us and the best for Tess. Cullum Struan or Dirk Struan. The fog crept down on the ships at calm anchor. With the tendrils came a shadowed sampan. It nudged the anchoring fore hawser of the white witch momentarily. Hands held the hawser briefly, an axe rose and fell, and the sampan vanished as silently as it had appeared. Those on deck, the armed seamen and Negrek, officer of the watch, noticed nothing untoward. In fog, without a shore or other ships to judge by, a faint wind and a calm sea and a gentle tide would give no hint of movement. The white witch drifted shoreward. The boatswain sounded eight bells, and Negrek was filled with panic at the risk he was about to take. You cursed fool, he thought. You put yourself in mortal danger making tryst with Tess like this and... Don't go, stay on deck, or go to your bunk and sleep. But don't go to her. Forget her and forget today and forget last night. For months Negrek had been conscious of her, but last night, during his watch, he had peeked through the porthole of the cabin she shared with her sister. He had seen her in her shift, on her knees beside the bunk like an angel, saying her prayers. The buttons of the shift were undone, her nipples taut against the grasp of white silk. After she had finished her prayers she had opened her eyes, and for an instant he had thought she had seen him. But she had turned her eyes away from the porthole and had gathered the nightgown into a bustle, molding it to herself. Then she had moved her hands over herself, caressingly, languorously, breasts, thighs, loins. Then she had slipped out of the shift and stood in front of the mirror. A tremble had run through her and then she had slowly dressed herself again, and sighed, and blown out the lantern and slipped into bed. And then today, watching her run down the beach, her skirts flying, watching her legs and wishing himself between him, he had made up his mind to have her. This afternoon on board, helpless with terror and longing, he had whispered to her and seen the blush and heard her whisper back, yes, Negrek, tonight at eight bells. The new watch came on deck. Get thee below, Negrek, Gorth said, stamping up to the poop. He relieved himself in the scuppers, then yawned and took his place on the quarterdeck by the binnacle and shook himself almost like a dog. The wind veered to the east. I felt it. Gorth irritably poured himself a tot of rum. Cursed fog. Negrek went to his cabin. He took off his shoes and sat on the bunk, the sweat chilling him. Choked by his stupidity but unable to control it, he slipped out of his cabin and noiselessly tiptoed aft down the corridor. He stopped outside the cabin. His hand was wet as he tried the handle. Hardly breathing, he entered the cabin and closed the door behind him. Tess, he whispered, half praying that she would not hear him. Hissed, she answered, or you'll wake Lilibet. His dread increased, his mind shouting, leave, his ache forcing him to stay. This be terrible dangerous, he said. He felt her hand come out of the darkness and take his and guide him to the bunk. You wanted to talk to me, what did you want? She said, fired by the darkness and the secrecy in Negrek's presence, terrified by the fire, loving it. Now be not the time, love. But you wanted to talk secret. How else can it be secret? She sat up in the bunk and pulled the clothes tighter around her, and let her hand rest in his, her limbs liquid. He sat on the bunk, choked with desire. His hand reached out and he touched her hair, and then her neck. Don't, she murmured, and shivered as he fondled her breasts. I want to marry thee, love. Oh yes, oh yes. Their lips touched. Negrek's hand molded her, traveled her. And in the wake of his touch came the frantic terror heat. Centering, centering. Gorth turned away from the fog as the boatswain sounded one bell and wandered over to the binnacle. He looked down at it, the screened lantern flickering, and couldn't believe what he saw. He shook his head to clear it and looked again. It be impossible, what's amiss, saw. The boatswain said, startled. The wind, by God. It be west, west. The boatswain ran to the binnacle, 
but Gorth was already charging along the deck scattering the seamen. He leaned over the bow and spotted the severed hawser. Be lay there, we be adrift. He shouted in sudden panic, and pandemonium swept the deck. Let go the aft anchor. Godrot you, hurry. As the seamen rushed for the aft hawser, the keel scraped the rock bottom and the ship shuddered and cried out. The cry swept through the timbers and into the furnace of the cabin, and Negrek and the girl were paralyzed for an instant. Then he left her clinging warmth and was out in the corridor and charging for the deck. Brock ripped open his cabin door and half saw Negrek racing up the gangway, and he half noticed that the girl's cabin door was open but forgot it in his blind rush aloft. Liza hurried out of the main cabin and across the corridor and through the open door. As Brock came onto the quarterdeck, the anchor was let go, but too late. The White Witch gave a final scream, heeled slightly to port, and grounded heavily. At that moment Sampan swarmed out of the fog and fell on her with grapples, and pirates began to scramble aboard. The pirates were armed with muskets, knives and cutlasses, and the first on deck was Scragger. Then the men of the White Witch were fighting for their lives. Gorth sidestepped a Chinese who lunged at him and, catching the man by the throat, broke his neck. Negrek picked up a fighting iron and slashed at the encroaching horde, noticing Scragger and other Europeans among the Chinese. He maimed a man and rushed toward Brock, who was covering the gangway into the quarters below. And to the bullion in the hold. Scragger cut down a man and backed off, and watched his men attacking. Below, by God! He shouted, and he led the rush at Brock. Others swept forward and decimated the first of the watch that was pouring from below decks. Brock blew the face off a European, ground the useless pistol into the groin of another and slashed a berserk swath with his cutlass. He lunged at Scragger, who sidestepped and pulled the trigger of his leveled pistol, but at that second Negrek crashed into him and the ball whined harmlessly into the fog. Scragger whirled, snarling, and hacked at Negrek with his cutlass, wounding him slightly, then turned in the melee and hurled himself at Brock again. His cutlass sliced through a seaman. Then Brock had him by the neck and they fell, flailing with fists and knees. Brock gasped as Scragger's cutlass crunched into his face. He picked himself up and flung Scragger aside and cut at him. Scragger rolled away just in time, and the cutlass fractured as it smashed into the deck. Brock buried the broken cutlass in a Chinese who jumped at his throat, and Scragger darted to safety behind a screen of his men. Gorth was charging into the main deck Malastrum, cutting, hacking, when a knife ripped into his side and he gasped and fell. Brock saw his son drop, but he stayed at the gangway fighting and killing. Below, Liza Brock herded Tess and Lilibet into the main cabin. Now, don't thee fret, girls, she said slamming the door from the outside. She planted herself in the corridor, a pistol in each hand and two spare pistols in her pocket. If the enemy came down the gangway before the fight was over, it would mean that her man was dead or unconscious. But four pirates would die before they passed her. Led by Scragger, the pirates slammed into Brock's crew and were again repulsed. More seamen fought their way out of the forecastle. Three of them joined Brock near the gangway and they flew at the pirates, driving him back. A belaying pin smashed into Scragger's back and he knew the fight was lost. Immediately he shouted something in Chinese and his men broke off battle, shinned like rats down the side into the sampans, and fled. Scragger leaped off the prow and vanished into the water. Brock grabbed a musket from one of his men and rushed to the side. When Scragger's head broke the surface for an instant, Brock fired but missed and the head disappeared. Brock swore, then hurled the empty musket into the darkness. His men began firing at the sampans, which quickly dissolved into the fog. When there were no more escaping pirates to kill, Brock ordered the enemy dead and wounded to be cast overboard and turned his attention to Gorth. Blood was oozing out of the wound that Gorth covered with a clenched fist. Brock pried his son's hand away. The knife had cut deeply under his arm and toward his back. Have thee coughed blood, lad? No, D.A. Good. Brock wiped the sweat off his face and stood up. 
get pitch, and grog, hurry, by God, them what's cutted, come aft, the rest get to the boats and pull us an off, tides full, hurry, Negrek tried to clear the agony from his head as he got the boats lowered, blood streamed from his shoulder wound, Brock gave Gorth a tankard of rum, and as soon as the pitch was bubbling on the brazier, he dipped a belaying pin into it and worked the pitch into the wound. Gorth's face contorted but he made no sound. Then, Brock doctored the others with rum and pitch. Me, saw, you forgot me, one of the seamen moaned. He was holding his chest. There was blood froth on his lips, and air sucked and hissed from the wound in his chest. These dead, best make thy peace with thy maker, Brock said. No, no, by God. Give me the pitch, saw. Come on, by God. And he began screaming. Brock knocked him out and he lay where he fell, the air hissing and bubbling. Brock helped Gorth up. Once erect, Gorth stood on his own feet. I be all right, by God. Brock left him and checked aft. The boats were pulling strongly. It was slack water. Put your backs into it. He shouted. Ready a four anchor, Negrek. They hauled the ship to safety, the leadsman calling the soundings, and when Brock was sure that they were safe, he ordered the anchor let go. The ship swung with the ebb tide and settled herself. Sailmaker. I, I, seer, the old man said. So shrouds for they, he said, pointing at the seven bodies. Use the old mainsnel, a chain at their feet and over the side at sunup. I be sayin the service like always. I, I, seer. Brock turned his attention to Gorth. How long after thee came on watch were we grounded? Nought but a few minutes. No it were just one bell. I remember distinct. Brock thought a moment. We couldn't be drifting from our moorings to shore in one bell. No how. Then we bead cut adrift in watch before. Brock looked at Negrek and he flinched. Thy watch. Twenty lashes at sunup for them what was on deck. Yes. Sir, Negrek said, terrified. But for thee I bead deaded from that god-cursed pirate's pistol, so I be thinking about thee, Negrek. Then he went below. All's well, love, he said. Liza was stationed like a rock in front of the children's cabin. Thank you, Tyler, she said and put down the pistols. Were it bad, passing bad, it be the bullion, pirated in harbor, in harbor. There beat English among pirates. I killed one, but the leader, Godrot him, he slipped away. The kids all right? Yes, they be inside, asleep now. Liza hesitated. I think I'd better talk to thee. We be talkin', bain't we? She walked down the corridor gravely, to the main cabin. He followed her, and she closed the door. At three bells Brock came on deck again. The fog had lessened but the wind had fallen off. He sniffed and tasted it and knew that soon the wind would freshen again and by morning the fog would vanish. Gorth, let's below and check the cargo. None of those gallows fornicating bait got below, d.a. We be looking anyways. You come too, Negrek. Brock picked up a lantern and they went to the hold. There, the door be still bolted, Gorth said, his wound racking him. Brock unlocked the door and they went inside. He set the lantern on the bullion and relocked the door. Have thee lost thy senses, D.A.? Gorth said. Brock was looking at Nagrek. What's amiss, Mr. Brock? Nagrek was petrified. Seems that Nagrek's been fingering thy sister, Gorth. Tess, I didn't, I didn't, by God, Nagrek burst out. I didn't at all. Brock picked up the cat o nine tails that hung on the wall of the hold. Seems he went to her cabin while she slept and then walked her and played with her. I didn't touch her. I didn't harm her. I didn't by God. Nakik cried. She ASKT me into her cabin. She ASKT me. This afternoon she ASKT me. She did, by God. So you was in her cabin. Gorth lunged for Negrek and cursed with pain as the pitch of the wound in his side parted. Negrek fled for the door, but Brock shoved him back. You are a dead man, Negrek. I didn't harm her I swear to God I swear to. You put your stinking hands under her shift. 
The cat clawed Negrek again and again as Brock drove him deeper into the hold. You did? By God, didn't you? I swear to God I didn't touch her. Doan, Mr. Brock. Please, it were no harm done. I'm sorry, I only touched her. There were nothing more, nothing more. Brock stopped, his breathing spasmodic. So it were true. You heard, Gorf. Both men sprang at Negrek, but Brock was faster and his fist smashed Negrek unconscious. He pushed Gorf away. Wait, but, D.A., that scum. Wait, your ma said the poor lass were afeard to say anything at first. Tess be thinking because he touched her there now she be going to have child. But Liza sighed Tess still be virgin. He only touched her, praise be to God. When Brock had caught his breath, he stripped Negrek and waited until he was conscious. Then he cut away his manhood and beat him to death. 